Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Angela Chapman, and I'm the president and CEO of the VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you today to our Care Connect series webcast. In this version, we'll be talking about virtual health. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we are hosting this webinar on the tra uh, traditional and ancestral land of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil nations. In mid-March, uh, as many of you are all very acutely aware, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. And with that, we saw Vancouver Coastal Health and indeed all of British Columbia's healthcare system swing into uh, gear to um, ensure the safety and well-being of the population of British Columbia. And it's responded very quickly, very rapidly, and I think to some some people's uh, um, uh, experience much quicker than they had ever seen healthcare uh, move uh, before and adapt to the, the current situation. And so uh, one of those areas that it adapted very quickly in is virtual health. And that's what we're going to explore today and just what we've been seeing and uh, how that has changed from the past and what has changed from the past for it to become such a, a, a feature of our healthcare system. And, explore what that means for the future of, of virtual health as well. While these technologies were not new, COVID certainly accelerated their adoption. And in fact, it's kind of remarkable. Less than a year ago, the Canadian Medical Association issued a discussion paper. And in that discussion paper, it said that 71% of Canadians would like to be able to book an appointment electronically with their physician, but only 9% of family physicians actually offered it. On June 8th of this year, so not even a year later from that discussion paper, the CMA reported that nearly half of all Canadians have accessed, accessed a physician using virtual care. And of those, the satisfaction rate was 91%. So quite a dramatic change in that period of time. When the Canadian Medical Association issued this discussion paper a year ago, they highlighted that there were really three barriers to the adoption of virtual health care. One was the governance of compensation mechanisms with respect to insured services within the provincial and territorial boundaries and their portability across those boundaries. We know that BC has been kind of on the forefront of some of those changes and then also accelerated across the country and in BC during this pandemic. So that's one of the areas that's been addressed as a, as a barrier. The other two are the licensure, licensure restrictions on the provision of care across those boundaries as it exists in the British North America Act, pretty old act, 1867, um, and the lack of interoperability and connectivity between and among patients, physicians, and healthcare facil health uh, facilities. That gets more to the electronic uh, part of virtual healthcare, and, and I know our panelists are gonna dig into that a little bit. So to speak more about these uh, innovations and the learnings and challenges that we are currently facing and going to face in the future in terms of virtual, virtual health care, I'm delighted to have three experts with me today. I have Dr. Kendall Ho, who's emergency physician, Vancouver General Hospital and lead on the digital emergency medicine at UBC. Dr. Chad Kim Singh, who's our associate vice president of medicine, quality and safety, Vancouver Coastal Health, and previously our head of emergency department and Sharday Brown, who's the leader, Virtual Health, Vancouver Coastal Health. Thank you all three of you for being with us today. Thanks for inviting us. Um, so I would just like to um, begin um, by say, by, oh, sorry, I have to, my apologies. I have to give some directions to the audience. Uh, first is that um, you will all be muted. You're already muted. If you have a question uh, to ask, there's a chat box. Please jump in in the chat box. Um, only the panelists will see uh, your questions. And uh, I have some help with some curation of all of those questions. We'll get to those uh, as we move along. We will, we will be taking those questions as we go along. So please do put them in there as you think of those questions. Uh, we are using the term virtual health and virtual care um, as one and the same. And um, I would just ask that uh, perhaps as we move along, we can give some definition to the difference between that virtual health and virtual care. I have to apologize because my cat 
has just jumped up on the table in front of me. And so if he walks across, I apologize for the interference. This is one of the challenges of, vir of virtually working from home. Um, and also uh, the session is being recorded and people are welcome to view it afterwards and share it with others to see as well. We also have an interesting feature in, in the spirit of virtual health and innovation. Today, we're going to be introducing a poll. And so we're gonna start with one polling question to get a sense of people's comfort levels with virtual healthcare. It's come up on screen now, so I would ask all of our attendees to take a look through this. The question is, have you had a virtual visit with a healthcare provider? Please answer uh, one of those answers that you've either not, neither tried it or you've never tried it rather. You've tried it and you don't like it. You've tried it, you're indifferent, or you've tried it and you loved it. And if we can give you a few seconds to do that, I apologize for those who have joined on phone that you're not able to participate in this. So the very quick results. It looks like actually quite a lot of people who are on the line haven't tried it. So that's an interesting uh, feature in itself, given what we heard from the Canadian Medical Association about the number of people who've tried it. There are a mix between those who find, are kind of indifferent to it and who've loved it. So that's really quite interesting. So I'm gonna use that then as the starting off point to um, go back to our speakers and just ask each one of you, if you could um, please um, start by telling us a little bit about what your role in the virtual healthcare space is. And I'm gonna start off with Kendall. Kendall, can I start with you? And also perhaps just your reaction to that poll result. You bet. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for the audience. Uh, great, uh, great voting. Uh, it looks like a, a good 60% of you have experienced uh, uh, some type of virtual care. So I'd love to kind of dig into that a little bit. And 40% uh, uh, of you may be exploring this area and thinking about this. Uh, I'm an emergency doctor. I've been working in Vancouver General Hospital for too many years. Not going to disclose how many years. It shows my age. Uh, also a practitioner of virtual care. Uh, I deliver uh, virtual medicine uh, through some uh, a couple of public venues, especially, for example, uh, 811. I participate as a virtual physician there and also participate in organizing some of the virtual care type of services, both in Vancouver Coastal Health and also working in the Ministry of Health in British Columbia. Uh, so I hope that I can bring some of those uh, experiences and also some of my own uh, uh, understanding, and I welcome the audience to inform me and teach me about more about what you care about virtual care. Excellent. Thank you, Kendall. Sade, we go to you now. Hi, I'm Sade Brown. I work as a leader of the virtual health department here at Vancouver Coastal. I'm a registered nurse by background, so I bring that clinical uh, perspective to this position. Uh, what my role really is, is helping partner with clinical programs to really determine their virtual health needs and help them accelerate that plan. So we look at policy and partner with external stakeholders like Ministry of Health and our privacy and security folks and help implement the change within the clinical area, really acting as partners to, to drive that change. Terrific. Thank you. Are you surprised by the poll result? No, not at all. I think it's it's pretty indicative of what we're seeing out in the general population. And it and as a person who's been working in the virtual health department since we kind of started in early 2019, it's it's really exciting to see that growth. Excellent. Dr. Kim Singh, how how are you doing this morning? I'm good, thank you. Um, and, and thanks very much for uh, having us all here and having this opportunity to uh, share and learn together. Um, so for myself, I've been an emergency physician for about 13 years at Vancouver General and UBC uh, Hospital. Um, and as Angela mentioned previously, the uh, department head for emergency medicine. So part of that role was to ensure the quality and safe operations of our emergency departments at UBC and BGH. In my current role as an associate vice president uh, for medicine quality and safety, um, my report portfolios include integrating uh, quality and safety uh, and medical affairs and our medical staff. So what that would uh, partly boil down to is when we look at innovation and virtual health and virtual care, it's ensuring that our medical staff, our physicians, nurse practitioners, midwives, dentists, uh, are using the uh, technology appropriately, that is, it's effective, um, that we integrate our medical staff using a quality uh, and safety lens, but also helping to build an innovation and virtual health roadmap for our organization, working closely with experts like Chardet and, and Kendall and others, 
um, to make sure that uh, we have the right stakeholders, we have the right integration, we have the right engagement. And certainly part of my portfolio includes physician engagement. Um, so it's making sure that our physician voices are represented, that the ideas are represented, but also partnered uh, with other parts of the organization and external stakeholders. Because no one group can make this work alone. So it's a lot of integration. Well, I think you're on uh, mute. I'm sorry about that. Um, so let's start off with some of the basics. How do we define virtual healthcare and virtual health and virtual care? Um, where do we see it being used now? What are some of the uh, the methods that people are using in virtual care? Sharday, do you want to start with that? Sure. I think for me, a virtual care, virtual healthcare is really utilizing existing technologies, even as simple as a phone, all the way to advanced technologies to connect. Uh, clinicians to patients, to clinicians to clinicians, to facilitate care discussions, regardless of where you are physically located. That's an interesting point. So you, it also includes physician to physician, not just physician to patient. Kendall. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Sade. I think uh, it's, it's really about at the core of it, how can technology support the deliver of health services at a distance? So very often people think about the distance being rural and remote, which is correct, but also in urban situations, for example, if a patient might be, for example, physically limited, not being able to leave his or her home, then again, delivering care at that person's home is again also about virtual care. Or in situations where we may not be able to bring a group of health professionals together around our patient, for example, a family doctor, a specialist, and the patient, then again, virtual care can bring that virtual team together. And at the core of it, I think there may be three kind of things to think about in virtual care. Number one is uh, what we call synchronous, which is kind of like this Zoom conversation where we can all spend time together. Secondly, it's about asynchronous, being able to, for example, use emails, use text message, send an image, send an ECG, send a skin rash. Again, that's a type of virtual care that's delivered asynchronously. And then the third is about data, for example, using home health monitoring so that when a patient is at home, he or she can monitor their own blood pressure and the health professional can see it and then use that as data to support care. So all those are different forms of virtual care in action. Excellent. Well, I might start with you then, Chad, on a different question. Um, what sort of problems, even pre-pandemic, were uh, well suited to virtual health care? Great. Thanks for the, the question, Angela. I think, you know, typically we, we um, in, in Canada, I think we've been um, behind some other uh, similar countries in the adoption of um, technologies in virtual care. And pre-pandemic, I think what we were using uh, telemedicine, virtual care for, uh, were things like um, common uh, uh, health issues. Um, it could be things like uh, a virtual visit for uh, cold symptoms, uh, sore throats, um, you know, sort of uh, more simple um, presentations. Um, we were also using it for uh, pre-pandemic for uh, follow-up of chronic diseases. Um, so uh, Ken will likely speak later to uh, a project called Tech for Home, but it was following, um, it is following uh, congestive heart failure patients. So patients whose heart, which are muscle, aren't working as effectively as they should. And, it, and um, uh, using technology and remote, remote monitoring to ensure that they are staying safe in the community and at home. So we've seen the, the pre-pandemic applications and use of um, uh, virtual health um, sort of explode during the pandemic into where we are now. And, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about more of those examples. Um, but I think, as you mentioned, some of the limitations and barriers, perhaps just, um, you know, um, not having been uh, used to using uh, certain technologies um, limited our scope of what we're using uh, virtual care for. I think uh, as the pandemic has shown, um, you know, by virtue of having to social distance, stay safe, um, and have sort of small bubbles, we've had to change the way we think about delivering healthcare, um, keeping patients safe in mind, safety in mind, uh, and this has led to uh, a, a huge growth in opportunity for us to explore and, and use virtual health. Excellent. We're going to come back to the technology piece in a minute and, and kind of who's got a challenge with the technology, the user or the physician. 
uh, or the medical system. We'll come back to that in a minute. But in the meantime, Shade, I'm wondering, I, I've seen some statistics that show that some of the specialist areas at VGH actually increased their volumes of the number of people that they saw during the pandemic using this technology. What are some of the um, some of the insights from that? Is it, you know, it, it was obviously driven by a need. There wasn't really an alternative. Um, but are, it, you know, your group is really looking at it from a system change and a system a adoption point of view. What, what do you think are some of the takeaways from that? What are you learning from this right now? I think that the pandemic forced a bit of a change in in thinking, uh, as you guys had mentioned about how we deliver healthcare, and and seeing, uh, looking at their in-person appointments and seeing where it's appropriate to have that virtual care, especially for clients that we're seeing from different communities, being an urban center and being you know experts and leaders in specialty care, we were having patients drive down from Prince George for an hour appointment once a year, and now the clinician focus has changed to, if I'm having just a conversation with them, is it applicable to have that uh, you know, through a video means and, and using that different type of care? And what they've noticed throughout that is that the actual care itself hasn't really been affected. It's still the same quality of care, and having that face-to-face -face connection is still there and able to deliver that exceptional care. Hmm. So the face-to-face -face aspect of it, even though we've talked about other applications of virtual healthcare, that is a really kind of key component to delivering better patient patient care. Yes, exactly. Okay. So you know, coming back to that technology question for a moment, are you know we 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 saw in the poll at the front that there are quite a number of people who are on this uh, call that haven't used it yet, but you know, is it are there technology barriers? Are they primarily with the the client or the patient being able to use the technology and are there solutions to that or are there like also on the medical practitioner side are there problems with the with the use of the technology maybe i'll start with kendall on that one yeah absolutely yeah definitely uh, i think part of virtual care is the technology itself uh, but i'd like to emphasize that it's very important that both the patients and the health professionals need to be comfortable with the technology. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it is very important at this point, I'm very glad that we have a great audience who have some experience, who want to gain more experience with it. And so same thing for health professionals, you know, as we see more and more family doctors, in fact, there's a much larger number of family doctors now in British Columbia who use the technology and specialists using it. In Vancouver Coastal, we have specialists increasing using it. All of us need to learn together to do that. At the end of the day, I think several key things to keep in mind. Technology is but a tool. The most important thing is that there is a relationship that builds the patient and health professional therapeutic relationship. I think that's gonna be very important. So building that comfort and building that technology use based on that's important. Just like you know, we have our friends, we get to know our friends. And so with that, emails, video conferencing, FaceTimes become very useful because we maintain our relationship. So in the same way, virtual care is but a part of the delivery of care. I think secondly, I think virtual health really provide that convenience and which is very good. And also in the time of need, as you talk about, it's very important for us to have that social distancing. And so in the time of COVID, that's why technology become very important. But convenience should never trump quality. And so the question is, how does virtual care, using a type of technology that's necessary to deliver that type of quality of care? And so as a virtual physician myself that practice it, as a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine doing research on it to characterize best practices, these are the very important elements so that the technology itself is useful, but it's not the shiny objects that we need to focus on, but we really at the end is focusing the second part of that word, care, to make sure it's high quality. Interesting. Chad, do you have some reflections on that? Yeah, I do. I, and I think it's um, great points uh, made all around. And I would agree that it has to do, I think, with change uh, at, at the heart of a lot of this. It's a change in how we uh, have typically traditionally um, practiced uh, healthcare and practice medicine and uh, other fields within healthcare. So uh, mental health, you know, in physiotherapy, and massage, therapy, all these sorts of things. and um, you know, we, so that mindset has to change and has to be trust as well. And it's difficult, um, as you pointed out, Angela, both for our patients and families and for our healthcare providers. 
because it's a different way, uh, it's a different perhaps skill set. Um, it's a skill set to not only interact with certain technological platforms, but also to get comfortable with uh, a virtual remote interaction rather than um, sort of a high touch hands on, you know, experience, physical exams and so forth. And so what we are very mindful to do is make sure that we are rigorous in how we evaluate um, the application of virtual care. And that's to say that just because we can do it, it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do in every case, every situation for every patient. Just as one would imagine that we have diagnostic capabilities, let's say um, uh, MRIs, CAT scans, endoscopies, other things, um, we wouldn't use it on every single patient because we can use it. It has to have the right indication and use uh, and benefit. Um, and so we're certainly looking at the different um, patients, the patient populations, the disease processes, uh, where virtual health actually will make a difference. Um, and we are trying to make sure that we don't um, get overly optimistic about um, a broad application where we, if we don't know that it's going to work very well. Having said that, a lot of data has pointed to uh, the successful application of um, virtual care in uh, many ways, in, in many clinical areas, um, both with um, similar or better outcomes. Um, so we wanna make sure that we match our outcomes um, and our patient experience to our use of uh, virtual care. Excellent. Well, Sade, you have a particular perspective, I think, where you're sitting uh, as a person trying to make that, uh, and the team trying to make that system change. Where do you see some of the blockages in terms of the technology adoption? Which side of that? I direction? think historically there's been a big concern that patients of different age groups might have difficulty either accessing or utilizing the technology. So one thing I think we're really excited about working with our provincial partners across uh, you know, with the ministry is we're going to soon launch a citizen service desk. So should you be one of those folks that has some concerns about using the technology, you'll have a number to call that they can help you walk through the steps. Um, additionally, when uh, as a program of virtual health, we're not looking to implement a lot of different technologies. So if I'm having a video visit here in Coastal, I don't want to have five different applications that I have to help navigate with patients. So really focusing in on the best applications to use so a patient has a better experience across the board and again, partnering with those provincial stakeholders. And then on the, the clinician side, um, we're writing guidelines around how to have appropriate virtual consults. So remembering to maintain eye contact with the camera, making sure that you're in a professional setting so that we're able to maintain that professionalism and quality of care that you would get if you were having an in-person uh, appointment as well. Excellent. So just briefly coming back, before we go to our next poll, I wanna just come back to a point that Chad was making that not all types of um, uh, either um, illnesses or situations of patients is gonna be conducive to good care by virtual care. Do we have any data yet that sort of indicates those things which are well suited to virtual care versus those things which we know are not well suited to virtual care. Who would like to take a tackle on that one first? Mendel? Jump in a little bit. Uh, I think one is if there's a relationship between the patient and the health professionals, they know each other, the, uh, the virtual care becomes very effective. For example, follow up of a patient after a face to face visit would be very, very effective or if a, uh, a specialist, like a surgeon or a, 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 a internal medicine specialist, having known a patient and then now screen for any additional issues, again, very, very useful. And also third is in screening. For example, if someone is located outside of Vancouver, may need to come to Vancouver General Hospital for care, that the preliminary or the first meeting through distance would be, again, a very, very effective piece. In mental health, again, it's been established for many decades that uh, virtual care in mental health, to be able to use this technology to establish relationship and establish an ongoing rapport, again, it's very, very effective. And so, for example, in some of my work in virtual physician, I work with 811 to support the screening of patients, whether they need to go to emergency department or not. And so this type of technology would be very useful for that type of screening so that we can support those care. And so those are situations where technologies like this build on a strong relationship, builds on a very strong case of use, will be very helpful. Maybe I'll mention one more. It's for example, is someone who received surgery in Vancouver and now heading back to their own community. Having this type of technology, for example, with their family 
from where that community is, connect through virtual care to talk with health professionals here with the patient in terms of post-operative care, in terms of after discharge, what needs to be watched out for, how do you do dressing changes, so that by the time they go back to the community, we again as health professionals can support them at home. Again, that's a wonderful use of technology, which historically may not be as easy or as able to be done, yet technology enabled that to be done. Excellent. Chad, you have an interesting lens with safety. Where is it maybe not so good to apply virtual care? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think um, one of the things would be perhaps um, to Kendall's point to build that out, the initial visit. So if it's initial visit for screening, um, where it's just about, I guess, taking a history, talking about the issue at hand, I agree. Uh, remotely and virtually can be very effective. I think, though, a lot of our uh, clinicians have found that the initial visit, which often is longer than, say, subsequent visits, um, where there usually is a, a proper full physical exam and examination and so forth, um, at present, we don't have necessarily the, um, the seamlessness uh, from a virtual uh, capability lens. And so there still is importance to having that initial first visit in person to have the full physical exam. Um, and, and make sure that we've documented and we've considered uh, many different things. And we've seen this through the pandemic as well. Uh, I would think to some of our cardiology colleagues, some of our neurology colleagues, um, what they had thought was um, where they had tried uh, to see some patients their initial visit virtually, they really felt that a lot, they had to call in patients uh, for in, uh, inpatient in, uh, uh, in-person visits to be able to um, be able to diagnose or have that uh, proper acumen. I think for very acute conditions, um, virtual health may not replace um, uh, in-person care. So the things that come to mind would be crushing chest pain. You know, being an emerge doctor, we think of the, the bad things that we always think about. We think about the heart disease, the, the heart attacks, the massive strokes, um, the big traumatic accidents. Well, those sorts of things actually, and I think it was um, uh, Kendall, I think Friday as well, made the points earlier about connecting clinicians to clinicians. So while that may actually be a good way to use virtual care for a, a remote or rural physician in a hospital that has a car accident patient uh, connecting in with uh, a colleague, uh, an emergency physician in uh, you know, an urban setting, that can help, but that wouldn't be you know, a, a means for a patient to seek care instead of in person. So part of the, the safety lens and the messaging would be to make sure that there's that consideration from patients and families that Again, just because it, you can do a virtual visit doesn't mean it is the best thing to do in all situations. And I would say, again, the first visits uh, would be a consideration and the really acute, uh, worrisome conditions. Again, the big things that come to mind are, are heart attacks and strokes uh, because that you really want to save as much time as possible. So you really want to get yourself in front of a healthcare profession. Okay, terrific. Well, let's try our next poll, and then we've got some questions that are coming in from the audience. Should we go to that poll? Because I think it gets that, uh, here's the question. What do you see as the biggest deterrent or barrier to more widely adopting virtual care as a patient? And in fact, we've got a couple of, we've got a, one very pointed question about that. But the answers uh, for you to select are technology literacy, patient support for using health-based technology, lack of awareness, preference for in-person care, or lack of adoption by health professionals' health system? We'll just give you a second to uh, answer that. And as we're probably just gonna be a second away from having the answers to that. Um, okay, there we go. So interestingly, uh, the top answer is the technology literacy, but followed pretty closely by lack of adoption by health professionals and health system. And that would be interesting for uh, our panelists to comment on. Um, the question that came, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go incorporate one of the questions that's come in, where one of our, our, our viewers has, has indicated that they had a virtual healthcare checkup with their doctor, but the technology didn't work for them. And there is very little time in those uh, meetings to kind of work that technology bit out. So in sort of combining that poll, which has some interesting aspects about the system not adopting the technology and then people having technology changes. Shardy, do you want to speak to, and, and then I'll follow it uh, by Kendall and Chad, with sort of how do we support people to be able to adopt the technology? 
And I think I alluded to some of this in my previous answer, but again, focusing in on only a few key solutions so the patient aren't having to learn a myriad of technological solutions, helping work with our partners to set up that citizen service desk, but also when we're inviting patients to have a virtual appointment, we do include some key information within that and have the ability to have the patient test their technology prior to the appointment. And I think that is key to be able to work out those uh, kinks beforehand to make sure that when they arrive at the appointment, they're pretty confident that it's going to work uh, at that time. Um, additionally, we are um, refocusing how we're trying to get the information across to patients. So we are putting uh, user guides specifically focused towards the patient up on our external facing website on a dedicated page for virtual health so that um, patients can kind of go there beforehand to start feeling more comfortable with the technology. So if you've got an appointment, say, with your family physician, they often have their own kind of platforms for this, or they'll meet you on Skype. What, where do they go to to get the kind of information? Is it the, the website that you're talking about, is that, or is that specific to Vancouver Coastal Health? That one right now is specific to Vancouver Coastal Health, but in, in talking about looking for those few key technologies, we have been partnering with all of the other health authorities across the province and, and um, external stakeholders like Doctors of BC, and we're all fairly aligned with the, the platforms that we're using, so it shouldn't be you know, or something really different that you haven't heard of before, so we're you know, focusing in on those key technologies. Excellent. Kendall, from your perspective, any other kind of uh, words of advice that you can give those that are trying to figure out the technologies and how to use them? Yeah, I'm going to build on uh, Shade's great comments. I think it's absolutely right that we need to prepare ourselves. And so I think that's point number one is how do we as health professionals, how do we as patients support the learning and practice of using technology? And in that sense, my office works with the BC Ministry of Health uh, patients as partners with developing workshops what we call digital health literacy workshops so that we can support the general public uh, in uh, learning how to use, for example, desktop video conferencing. How do we look for information that's accurate on the website that's relevant for them and themselves? And also how do we download and use apps uh, for their mobile phones? So these are types of skills that we're developing and those workshops will be coming out in November. And so if any of the audience members are interested, perhaps we can contact VGH Foundation office, we can link you to that. So I think preparation is very important. But secondly, I think what Sade and Chad talk about is very important. As a health organization, as a doctor's office, what is the best practice of using technology? How do we want to make sure that the technology is not just for a solution looking for a problem, but actually address health issues? And so that's where the evaluation of Vancouver Coastal Health, the discernment that this is a useful service will be important. Uh, Chad talked about Tech for Home. In one of the ways that we work in Vancouver Coastal and province to look at home health monitoring as a technology so that we can demonstrate evidence. And then now we are propagating it moving forward and also working with, for example, a hypertension specialist now to not only look at heart failure, COPD, but extending that service. So again, demonstrating that evidence and making sure that as we offer the service, it's a evidence-based service. It's gonna be secondly, a very important part. I think the last part is that uh, it's a very important one too. And it's about practice. It's not just that, you know, when we use it the first time, right away we get it. But in fact, it's because of the constant using together, our, ourselves as health professional with our patients. As we continue to learn with each other, I bet, I, I know that tomorrow's virtual care will be very different from today. There'll be evolution, there'll be ways that we change and use uh, virtual care, text messaging, you know, uh, TikTok or whatever as we go forward. But if you have a strong relationship, if you have a strong way of linking health professionals and patients, and you're continuing to want to work together with that partnership, virtual care will evolve. And I think participating in that evolution will be very important. Excellent. Kendall, it's a beautiful segue that you gave uh, from the previous question into the research piece, and I'm going to come back to that. There is a question, however, from one of uh, our viewers that I, I want to throw out there because the technology barriers are, are real as much as we can sort of help people facilitate within the system the sharing of information between the different providers of care is something that people were asking about. 
and really kind of how the question was, will we get rid of the facts? But I think that's a little bit of a facetious question. The reality is the sharing of information that kind of one electronic medical record is remains a, a bit of a barrier or a significant barrier. Chad, do you want to start on that one first? Where do you see that going? Oh, thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, and it is um, an area that has been a, a focus for uh, some time, but even more so now. I think to um, Charlie's point, you know, the interagency and the, you know internal external collaborations between stakeholders is really important here. Um, right from the ministry, um, you know, the Ministry of Health uh, provincially, through the different uh, agencies, whether it be doctors of BC, uh, Health Employers Association of BC, the health authorities, um, there is uh, work being done to address uh, you know common issues to make sure that we have a so solid plans in place. Part of that does speak to a, um, a, an electronic medical record that is uh, either unified or that is accessible um, through other means. Now, we do have a, a platform called Care Connect, uh, very much the same as, as our series here, our webinar series. And Care Connect is a platform where if we have different, uh, different health authorities are using different uh, electronic medical records, we can access their records. And it's getting better all the time, but it's not as seamless as having the same uh, um, platform or, or, or product that we're all using. You know, it's it's it is interesting. The um, um, you know, uh, as Campbell mentioned, the the virtual platform that's being used with 811 um, Health Link BC. Uh, it's called Heidi, and um, I uh, had the privilege of, of of having a shift, my first shift with that on the weekend, and it uses a, an EMR that we are trying to get incorporated more um, more robustly, uh, and also to so that uh, family doctors can have access to it as well. So it speaks to the, uh, the the very point that we do need to have and share this information. Um, it is somewhat you know, limited as if, we, if we're able to have a virtual interaction and the information only stays in a silo. And so we know that that silo has to open up and has to be integrated. So I would say that there is certainly much more work that has been done. Um, you know, we have moved um, in Vancouver Coastal Health to adopting electronic medical records uh, through you know starting at uh, Lions Gate and then St. Paul's, Mount St. Joe's. Uh, up the coast as well. Uh, here in uh, around the Vancouver area, we're slated to go in within the next couple of years, but uh, we certainly recognize and move towards electronic medical records that are more portable um, and that can be accessed remotely by uh, a number of healthcare professionals. Um, one point I did want to make to the previous question about the technology, um, you know, sort of uh, barriers and uh, literacy is, you know, in my mind, I agree completely with um, the practice point that Kendall made. I envision it to some of the, you know, the iPhones or Android phones, you know, that we've, we've had for a decade now. When you think back to the early 2000s, we didn't have this. We had uh, the flip phones and we didn't have the smartphones and we've come a long way there. And if you think about the first time you interacted with a smartphone, it was probably hard. And, um, you know, every time they uh, have new models, it gets, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's, it's new, but you practice with it. You get better with it, you get more comfortable with it. And that's a similar type of thing I think we're going to need to see with virtual health, virtual care, both from the provider side, but also our patient side. Mm -hmm. yeah. And may I add a quick point about, uh, certainly agree with what Chad said, and also what Chade said, that the health bodies and Ministry of Health are working very closely together to advance the electronic health record. And uh, I, I sit on the uh, Clinical Leadership Council of the Provincial Ministry of Health Digital Health Strategy. And one of the pillar of the strategy is patient empowerment. And actually within that strategy, on the roadmap, there is the patient portal. It's not only to have the electronic health record so that we can share amongst health authorities, amongst hospitals, amongst doctors' offices, et cetera. But on the roadmap, it's about the patients accessing their own information in their patient own patient portal. So I think that's a very exciting development. And again, as we roll this out, it will be, uh, as the government rolls this out, it'll be gradually improving, uh, gradually uh, opening it up and having our uh, community members working together. For example, with Vancouver Coastal Health, so that we can improve that portal as we move forward, uh, will be a very important piece. So that's a roadmap that's ahead of us, but it's not that far ahead of us. And so that electronic patient portal will be a very important pursuit for us to work together. Excellent. Well, I don't, there's so much that we can keep on going on this topic, but I am going to shift just because of in the, in recognition of the time that we have left, I do want to spend some time, Kendall alluded to this, evaluation um, and, and, and collecting the data and understanding 
is very important to being successful. And, and our foundation has partnered with all of you, uh, all three of you and your areas to um, fund projects that are really trying new things and collecting data and evaluating. My question to you is, uh, and I'll start with Sade, um, what is what would be sort of the key KPIs that you think would, would, would um, be put for virtual health? I, I'm thinking of things like obviously savings in healthcare, less uh, emergency room uh, visits. There's probably a lot of others, but Sade, can you sort of for the sake of our audience, maybe explain in very broad terms what, what those would look like in, in evaluation of virtual health? Sure. I think some of the key uh, three things that we're looking at with any virtual health initiative is uh, patient satisfaction. We need to make sure that patients are, you know, having a good experience with it and it's not detrimental to their healthcare experience. Provider satisfaction, again, same thing, that it's not decreasing productivity in a way that's stalling our healthcare system and making those disparities of wait lists worse. And then around system impact, and you alluded to some of those things. So we're looking at length of stay, and I can talk a little bit later about one of the key projects that you helped us with, but um, uh, around length of stay and uh, readmission rates with home health monitoring. And those are kind of the broad things that we're looking at with any virtual health initiative. Excellent. Kendall, do you want to talk a little bit to that? Because you've been involved in a number of projects where you've had to do that kind of evaluation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, Sade is right on the money in terms of the types of things that we evaluate, uh, the, the, the end user satisfaction, health system impacts. Clearly, uh, the quality of care needs to also be evaluated. So, for example, the fact that we can decrease length of stay, decrease emergency department visit, becomes a very important issue, not only system impacts, but actually quality of care of our patients. Are they feeling better? Do they have better health outcomes? Uh, are they living longer? Uh, and decreasing need for, uh, for going to the hospital, for example. And, uh, and then finally, I think there's a very important aspect that we need to understand, and that's what's the underlying relationship of the patients and the health professionals and the relationship of the patients to the organization, such as Vancouver Coastal Health. How can we serve our patients better? And so very, uh, very fortunate, uh, uh, thanks to EJ's Foundation, and thank, thanks to actually uh, donors supporting the type of research. And there are three areas that we look at. Number one is how do we foster innovation? Uh, Chad mentioned about tech for home, uh, sending patients home, but when they go home with heart failure, that they go home with technology like blood pressure cuff, weights, measure the amount of oxygen in their blood, uh, and also the blood pressure, so that we can decrease their need to come back to hospital. In fact, in some of the studies, we found that actually there's a decrease to anywhere from 50 to 60% decrease in needing to come back to emergency departments while they're on home monitoring. And this home monitoring, by the way, because of COVID, we're able to leverage that knowledge as a province, as different health authority, to now use that for COVID monitoring. And so again, technology may apply in a certain situation like heart failure, like what we're moving forward to in high blood pressure, but it can use in different kind of settings. And also, so number one, uh, how innovation can be fostered. I think secondly, is how do we then demonstrate best practices? There may be a technology being in, introduced, but how do the different health professionals work with the technology and the data? How do patient-centered care, how do we support patient and their family caregivers to optimize and find the data to help them? So I think that's the second piece, is to define that best practices. Again, because of the, the, the philanthropy, we're able to identify health professionals that participate, for example, a monitoring clinician as a central role to support uh, uh, this research, to help us to advance it forward. And finally, you know, working with Sade and Virtual Health, working with Chad and Vancouver Coastal, how do we scale that up? So it's not only just about one hospital using it or one clinic using it, but once we identify these positive uh, uh, activities, how do we spread it through Vancouver Coastal Health, spread it through the province? Again, philanthropy has been tremendous in helping us to not only support the evaluation and research, but actually help us to spread, for example, our tech for home to 21 communities so we can actually demonstrate the value of the. That's great. Chad, just in, in terms of that um, evaluation, and again, sort of with your administrative hat uh, leading uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, how do you kind of ensure that it isn't just kind of the flavor of the month? And we've heard both from Sade and Kendall, lots of great measures and everything, but how do you ensure, because there's going to be a lot of pressure, and I would think coming out of this period, 
that we really get on the bandwagon. But how do we make sure that it's it's cost effective, or not just cost effective? I'm sorry, that it's got all of those um, um, criteria to make sure that we're um, not only adopting best practices, but the areas of virtual care that really make sense and not the others that don't. Thanks, Angela. You know, it's a great point because what we don't want to see, and I don't think we will see, is um, you know through the pandemic and when we reach a post-pandemic uh, uh, phase, uh, is losing the momentum and ground that we've gained um, in technology, innovation, virtual care. Um, and the reason I don't think that we will is because of um, how it addresses many of our priorities uh, as a province, um, as a society, um, and as um, health authorities and sites. Um, you know, other dimensions of, um, I think, to consider within, you know, key performance indicators are um, access and equity. Mm -hmm. um, and a whole a dimension in and of itself of quality is patient experience, patient and family experience. Those are priorities um, for uh, the, the province and for the ministry, because we know that one of the things we've been uh, addressing year after year is equitable access to healthcare. Now, this uh, is a potential level of that. It increases our ability to offer that, uh, no matter your socioeconomic status, no matter your geographic region, no matter your ethnic cultural background, that we want to be able to address that. So. Seeing how this actually allows us to address a lot of our key mandates that the province and the ministry has set forth, I think um, it's, an, it's potentially easier to continue these conversations. Um, it comes up in many different tables uh, with many different stakeholders. Uh, but I do think, you know, as with anything else, the key would then be to make sure that we have something actionable, that we are still heading in the right direction, that at each stage of the way there's something tangible, there's something crisp, there's something that we can do and experience and realize as a benefit and not just, again, carry on the conversation. So to the point before about the, uh, the EMRs, uh, that's exactly right. You know, I hope that we are gonna see even more movement on um, integrating EMRs and the accessibility of, of EMRs as we go forward because it's been highlighted now and we've got the momentum and the opportunity. So uh, to me, it's, it's, it's within the, the dimensions we talked about, it is definitely patient and family experience, but also equity uh, and access. Excellent. Shade, do you want to speak a little bit about uh, the project that our foundation is working with uh, you on now in terms of evaluating uh, clinical applications uh, of virtual care? Sure. I think, you know, coming off of the last year, uh, the foundation was able to fund us for a project that we're calling the Virtual Interpreter, and, and Chad has been fortunate enough to use it in his emergency department. And, um, Basically, in a nutshell, what it is, it's access to on-demand interpretation in up to 250 languages, either audio or video, by medically trained interpreters with a connection time of less than one minute, which has been a huge game changer for all of our clinicians that we've been able to implement it in. And without giving too much away, because we haven't had the ability to present to our executives or the back to the foundation, but we have shown a decrease in the length of stay, uh, both in acute in-person and in the emergency department. Uh, through that manual data collection. Additionally, we were able to see an, uh, like a staggering increase in the satisfaction of providers being able to provide proper assessment and timely care to the patients who previously they were having very difficulty um, having those medical conversations with. So very proud of that. And our next step for us is to look at how we can take this just beyond that initial phase and spread to the rest of the organization. Excellent. Great. Well, I'm going to turn. Oh, yeah, Chad. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just had a big thank you to Charday and team for the virtual uh, translator. As she as she mentioned, it's been a game changer. So our teams are now not depending on a phone call to a relative uh, to help translate a back and forth. We're not depending on perhaps asking other uh, staff that are on shift to help translate. Um, we have trained uh, people uh, that we can actually interact with virtually real time that are trained in medical uh, terminology so that we, you can translate that way because sometimes there's things lost in translation if you're using just a family member or what have you. So it's, it's, it's phenomenal and it's been very well received uh, and uh, supported through uh, philanthropy as well. So thank yeah. you. It's an excellent demonstration of where philanthropy pay, plays a role here because it's not an obvious thing that translation is going to save the system money. <laughs> and so it's hard to sort of make that argument, but you're making the argument for better care but then it helps it be more sustainable once you demonstrate through your services, Chardet, and the team that, in fact, that saves the, saves the system money. 
So we play that kind of catalyst moment uh, in changing the system through philanthropy. So thank you for sharing that example, it's a great one. Um, I'm going to just throw a, at you now a few of the questions that remain from uh, our audience. Um, one here about international kind of collaborations, like do, do we see, um, and, and obviously virtual, the, the belief is that virtual care means that there really are no borders, distance isn't an issue. So do we see collaborations forming where other international health institutions providing very specialized care uh, collaborate with us? And I don't know who wants to, like, Kendall, you're involved in a lot of international organizations around digital health. Do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. So the, the excitement is that there is a lot of potential and actual actual collaboration. Uh, so across Canada, uh, working with, for example, Province of Alberta, Province of Ontario are two examples. And also I have the pleasure of actually connecting with some European groups and also some Asian groups uh, in looking at how do we look at not only uh, having the expertise around the world uh, in sharing, but also very importantly about the data. Uh, talk about home health monitoring. When we think about it, um, the delivery of health care is when we are mostly sick. And that's about 5% or 10% of our lives. But in 80 to 90% of the time, we are healthy and we're in the community. And yet we don't have much information about ourselves when we're in good health. And so the opportunity of virtual health is not only to deliver care when it's needed, but also to track our own data, how our body is doing. Uh, how do we then know that we are good and then we get sick? And so a lot of international interest in this area, not only about general wellness, not only about supporting seniors and older adults at home, but also understanding the interface between community and hospitals. And so this is a rich area, not only for today, COVID caused us to jump into the whole area of virtual care, but a very important area in the next few years that many of us will be seeing grow and blossom. And so these international collaboration, again, having the support of grants, having support of ability to apply for these type of national grants, and also having philanthropy to support us. And one final thing I'd like to just add is that, you know, we as health professionals can provide the health professional angle of the research, but we need to work with technology companies, understanding that I do not invent mobile phones, but because of the presence of mobile phones, I can apply my medical knowledge to figure out how can we use those mobile phones for care. And so this type of partnership will be very rich for us to be able to advance virtual care. Not only do we benefit Vancouver Coastal Health, benefit our citizens in British Columbia, but because of these international collaboration, we can learn from each other and benefit how do we best support our patients in their wellness at home. Thank you for that, Kendall. Um, one, one last question, and then I'm gonna do a round of everybody to have your sort of final comment. Um, and I might just direct this to uh, Sade and, and Chad. Um, can virtual care help reduce our wait times? And interestingly, the way that the question has been asked is by going outside of BC. I think maybe this last little time has given us a bit of an insight into potential ways to use virtual health to, to reduce uh, wait times for specialists. Sharday, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, I think it's looking at streamlining existing processes to see where we can save some of that time, whether that be um, filling out forms beforehand, doing e-forms, and having that transferable to many different programs within Coastal So as a patient, I'm not filling out the same form eight different times to see, you know, eight different clinicians, um, all the way to streamlining those follow-up care appointments so that it opens the, up the wait list to, to new patients coming in. So I think there's innovative ways of looking at that, and, and it takes a team working with those clinicians um, right at the, the desk level to making sure that we're hitting those targets when we start thinking about future implementations of virtual health. Excellent, Chad. Thanks, no, I agree. I think that yes, it can help address wait times. Um, if I think uh, uh, interprovincially, uh, I think you know that's that's a big conversation in itself. I think if within our, our province, uh, within our health authorities, and I think yes as well, because there is definitely collaboration between our health authorities. You know, uh, there are uh, certainly instances where uh, patients on the island need some specialty care that can happen only in Fraser or in Vancouver Coastal Health, and we've been able to expedite initial visits. Um, uh, uh, through um, virtual care. Um, I think when we think about, you know, wait times being time and, you know, cost savings and money, um, I think um, that 
virtual care can certainly help address them. Um, if it also if it isn't used as just another add-on. So if we practice you know healthcare the same way, the same kinds of costing, and we just added on some virtual pieces, well you're adding on another cost and another time factor. If we integrate it properly so that if you save in other areas where you're not duplicating, as Shardia mentioned, um, then yes, I think we can streamline. I think we can actually have benefit in both cost and time. You know, the way we integrate um, our, our knowledge sharing is very important too. Um, you know, sometimes what happens is we have multiple uh, requests for the same imaging test for the same patient coming from specialist, family doctor, different health authority, or what have you. So in a better system where we're able to integrate better, then we would save time on having to have all these visits, these duplicate orders that are lost in the shuffle. Um, so I think there's a lot of benefit uh, to be gained. Um, the, the big detail, of course, is, is how we get it uh, done, but I think it offers us much opportunity. Excellent. Okay, well, the, listen, thank you all very much. But before we close off, I wanna give you each a, an opportunity to uh, provide any information, comment on anything that we didn't get to in terms of the questions. So I will start with Sade. Um, not so much of a, a comment, just a really a thank you to the foundation and to all the donors uh, on the call as well. Um, you know, without your support, I think it's hard to drive innovative practices throughout the organization. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for that. And I'm really excited to see the exponential growth in virtual health really starting from um, just seeing a few clinics to some clinics now going fully virtual is, is really a once in a career uh, thing for me. So it's very exciting and I'm, I'm happy to be part of this change for healthcare. Terrific. And Kendall? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, we are at the dawn of virtual care. I think COVID has pushed us into integrating virtual care into mainstream. I think there are three things I would like to suggest uh, for our audience to explore with us in virtual care. Number one is understand around us what's our existing virtual care services that you can take advantage of. So I do recommend if you have a family doctor, call that family doctor's office and see if they offer virtual care. In Vancouver Coastal Health, discover what are some of the virtual care services available. For example, provincially, 811 also offers virtual care. So use those type of services around you. I think that's number one. Number two is perhaps to prepare yourself for using the technology. Uh, some of you are very well adapted in, in using apps and using Zooms, uh, but you know, perhaps consider signing up workshops to learn about virtual care. Uh, we also have websites, for example, in BC Emergency Medicine Network, we have websites and apps that we suggest to the general public. If you're interested, there are a group of apps and websites that we do recommend that you may want to use, and other websites to learn more about that. And number three is if you're interested, we'd love to share with you what are some of the paths, not only for today's virtual care, but how do we get to tomorrow in the different kinds of data use for health, home health monitoring, virtual care with text messaging, secure text messaging, uh, the translation service that uh, Shade talked about. We'd love to be able to share with you, discuss with you, so that we can innovate and continue to move forward together. And so again, finally, I want to thank uh, uh, Vancouver General Hospital Foundations. Thanks, Angela, for inviting me, and also a wonderful partnership with you. I also want to thank the audience members taking an interest in this area. We'd love to be able to work with you and support you in using virtual care to support you in achieving wellness and health for yourselves. Excellent, Kendall. Thank you, Chad. Great, thank you. And I and I echo and I, I really wanted to thank everybody for taking the time uh, to join us today, uh, for, for being able to share and to learn with you. Um, and you know, I, I, I won't repeat the comments uh, necessarily, but I, again, we, we can't do this work and change and transform my healthcare system without uh, your partnership, without your commitment, without your help. So I'm I am sincerely very thankful um, for our partnerships and for the interest and the work that's ahead. Um, what I wanted to just wrap up with is uh, just acknowledging that we are still in the midst of the pandemic and, um, you know, albeit we're probably in our second wave right now, we're in the early days of it, but we're seeing a little bit of a rise. And I wanted to remind people to, um, you know, do the simple things still. That is what's going to keep you safe. That's what's going to keep us safe. And that's, you know, not touching your face if you don't, uh, if, you, if you can help it. Um, washing your hands frequently. Coughing into your arm um, so that you're not spreading things. Uh, using a mask when it's appropriate. Uh, keeping your your bubbles, your social bubbles, fairly small, you know, four to six people, um, and staying home if you're sick. 
you know, getting tested where we, we have the capabilities and we've got some resources for testing and contact tracing. But if you're sick and you don't need immediate care, whether it be virtual health or whether it be in person, um, stay home and keep others safe. Um, and also to listen to our, our public health colleagues and their uh, directives and their advice. So some of these simple things I think are really what's going to get us through the fall. Um, and um, uh, we'll be in it together. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chad. All right, we're going to finish with one last poll. So we're going to bring that poll up. We've got one last question for everybody, really with a view to see if this has made moved the needle at all in terms of your uh, likelihood to access healthcare, uh, virtual healthcare. Um, would you be more likely or less likely or unsure after this uh, presentation? So I'll get everybody to jump in and answer that. And as you do that, I'm just going to thank our speakers uh, one last time. Thank you, Sade. Thank you, uh, Kendall. And thank you, Chad, uh, for bringing your expertise here today to share with everyone, to uh, perhaps get everyone more comfortable with uh, virtual care and, um, and for letting us know kind of the challenges that we're facing. Well, we've got the government or jurisdictional issues around paying physicians and, and paying virtual care so that they can be facilitated, uh, physicians and specialists being able to make use of that mechanism, we still have some challenges around the technology, both in terms of adoption and in terms of the issues of uh, electronic medical record. You've really helped us understand those today, and uh, I'm very grateful to you. So it looks like we've really moved the needle uh, with our, our quick poll of everyone. Um, so wonderful to see that we've made a difference today in terms of the increasing uh, comfort with virtual healthcare. So uh, Chad, Kendall, and Sade, thank you for that. And uh, please have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks so much. Take care.